It's hey. time for the Kickwits, the show dedicated to talking about awesome crowdsourcing projects. Every episode, we interview amazing creators and showcase their work. I'm your host, Peter Bryant, and I'm joined by my co-host, Mike Kafis. Hey, Pete, you might want to yeah. close your uh, chat window on your uh, there, uh, hangouts. Love you, buddy. Chat window window. Hangouts. Oh, hangouts. Oh, how about that? Yeah. Thank you, Mike. How about that? Hey, Thank you, Mike. I'm here to, I'm here to hey, help. He's looking out. Thank you, buddy. Uh, I don't usually have that open. <laughs> On this episode of The Kickwits, we are talking with Rachel Ventura of Legendary Games. Hi, Rachel. Hello. And uh, Jimmy Sanders of Mythica, Game, uh, Mythica Gaming. About, oh, oh. Hey, hey, Jimmy. <laughs> about their new project, Fates of Madness. Uh, a cooperative RPG adventure card game based on the Gothic Campaign Compendium. Uh, Rachel Ventura is the business director for Legendary Games. She has been a freelance writer for AAW Games, John Brazer Enterprises, Misfit Studios, Playground Adventures, and Total Party Kill Games. Previously, she was the vice president of sales and marketing for Frog God Games. Rachel also serves on the board of RPG Creators Relief Fund, a nonprofit charity for game designers in need. In 2015, she was a guest of honor industry uh, insider for Gen Con. Jimmy, Jimmy Sanders, is the game designer behind Fates of Madness, an RPG card game co-created by Mythica Gaming and Legendary Games. Jimmy previously created the Legends of Draxia board game and the Draxia RPG, as well as Draxian lore and history. Jimmy aims to create games that are elegant and simple in gameplay, but complex and variable in strategy, making them accessible and interesting to non-gamers and gamers alike. Hey, y'all, welcome to the show! Thank you. <laughs> welcome. Welcome, welcome. So, yeah, this looks really cool. I was, uh, um, I, we've done a couple things with Legendary Games in the past, and Rachel contacted me and said, hey, we got, a, we got another project coming out. Would you like to come on? And I'm like, you guys are always welcome. You're one of, you're almost one of us. Uh, yeah. So, so we love uh, you guys. So we were like, yeah, absolutely, sure. And this time we got Rachel on the show. Yes, yes. Jason is finishing up all of the other Kickstarters that we have in our hoppers, uh, getting uh, Alien Beast Theory out, getting our pirate Kickstarters. We're fulfilling that right now, as well as Horse Kingdom. Um, the palace of those books got dropped off right about the same time Pirates was done, so we're fulfilling two Kickstarters. It's a little crazy and running this one, so you get me today. Yay! Yay. No, that's great. That's great. It's all, you know, we get, we get all these other peoples, and it's like, Rachel's always a bridesmaid and never the bride. <laughs> yeah, so, no, no, we love having you on. All right. You know. <laughs> all right, so that's awesome. So, uh, and, and Jimmy, this is the first time we're meeting you. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Um, so, so let, let's talk about this, this project. I mean, it looks beautiful. I, I was looking through it and it looks elegant as all, as all get out. Um, so it's, it's a, it's a, it's a card game, but it's a role playing game. So, so I guess, uh, Jimmy, why don't you go first? I think this is your baby, right? Is this your baby? Yes. Yes, it is. Okay. All right. So why don't tell me, tell me what this game is. Okay. Basically how the game works. Uh, I wanted to create a game that gave you the RPG experience, but was a quick, fast 20 50 minute one shot kind of thing that doesn't really require a lot of uh book reading to know um i've certainly played plenty of rpgs and introducing somebody new to a game sometimes that's a little heavy to go here i want to play mm -hmm. this game with you read this book first and i didn't right. want to have that for a card game here so how it works you create a party of four character cards um with four characters don't know how well we can see these but those are just yep, some examples of them so you create a party of four uh, if you're by yourself, you control all four characters. Uh, if you've got multiple players, then each person controls one or more of the character cards. Uh, and then you start the adventure. And so each turn, you draw a location card, and either that's going to be a place scenario card, or it's going to be a monster card. And so if it's a place scenario card, uh, such as these, right? then you've got uh, an event that happens. Um, so, for example, in this one, it's an abandoned laboratory is what this one is. So, basically, according to that card, you guys are walking into this uh, old laboratory, and there's vials of chemicals sitting all over the place. And you have to make dexterity checks to see if you accidentally knock them over. If right. you knock over chemicals, then you, everybody takes damage because you set off an explosion. And so that's the event. Um, and after you finish an event, then you go to the post-event action, which is, what do you guys want to do in here? whether you want to continue trying to make your own potions and risk setting off another explosion, or you might try to go, oh, I've got healing skills, so I'm going to heal somebody. Uh, or you might have something like the alchemy skill and make potions. 
Uh, so that'd be a scenario event like that. Okay. Uh, alternately, the adventuring party might come across a monster, such as that guy. Assuming we can see that well. The foul needler. Yeah. Yes, the foul needler. So, if you come across a monster, then you have to fight it. Obviously, uh, by default, monsters always attack first, so that keeps it nice and easy. You don't have too much confusion. So, monsters attack, and then the party attacks back. Uh, for the party's attack, you've got three different basic options. You can either do a basic attack, which is just uh, draw a fate card. That's the uh, numbered cards that are numbered one through six. That sort of replaces your die roll. So draw a fate card plus the weapon you use plus your attribute and do that much damage to the monster uh, minus the monster's armor. Or you can do a focus attack, which lets you pass your turn and the next turn you do bonus damage. Okay. Uh, and third option is you can throw a potion at the monster or throw a potion to apply the effect to an ally if you've got a positive potion. So you play through until you kill the monster. Once you kill the monster, you move on to the mm -hmm. next location. Uh, and that's pr how the gameplay primarily goes back and forth of adventuring through scenes and then killing monsters um, until on these cards that have the place scenarios, if you look in the corner, it's kind of small. There's a doom location, a doom counter that we got on these location cards. Mm -hmm. It says skull with a number. Right. Once you've drawn three cards that have the doom counters on them, then you draw out the final boss, which might be something like this guy or one of these things. Ooh, yes. Yeah. Each of the Doom cards have a different value on it. So depending on what those three Doom cards add up to, would um, if your, monster, your bond, boss monster would differ based on that number. Ah, exactly. Okay. So that helps keep the game more interesting and replayable because you've got a variety of different location cards with... Uh, and as you play through it, based on what those are, dictate what the final mo boss monster you fight is. After you fight the boss monster, if the boss monster kills all of you, well, you lose the game. If you kill the boss monster, then you win the game. Oh, so, okay. pretty straightforward there. Um, right. So, yeah, that's the general gameplay of it. Uh, as you adventure through, you can find extra treasure cards to re-equip your players with better equipment. Uh, you can make a variety of potions to help you to heal and fight monsters. Um, one thing that's kind of fun about the game, for the scalability to make it a more easier or difficult game, depending on the level of skill of the people at the table, we got uh, madness cards, where the part of the name comes in. So you got fate cards, mm -hmm. and if you got a fate card with a skull on it, that's the madness card. And that means that something extra bad would happen. So if you were doing a skill check, like trying to not knock over the potions and set off an explosion, well, you automatically fail. So that's like or, your fumble. That's your built-in fumble. Exactly. It's right. built-in fumble. Okay. And so if you're playing a veteran group, you can add in like six, seven, six or seven of these madness cards into your fate deck. Or if you're playing a novice group, you just take them all out, and then you've got a nice easy game. So mm -hmm. it uh, helps for different varying levels of skill. Right. Which I think but is if important. You're, if you're a sadist, can you, spell, can you, uh, do you sell extra fate cards? <laughs> uh, we'll make sure we will make sure there's enough in that deck to mean it's – nearly T impossible. Uh, I want a TPK. Yeah, if you, if well, in the fate deck, the fate deck acts as basically your die roll. Um, so you're adding your skill check or your weapon a proficiency to your die, die roll in this case would be the fate deck. So with the when the monsters pull a madness card, it's kind of like, it's not a crit, but they have a different level of stats that they use when madness is um, presented versus when it's not. So it can act good or bad depending on it's the monster pulling or the character. Okay, so you're exactly. saying so, that if, if the monster pulls the madness card, that's good for you. No, no, that's bad for that's bad that's, for the that's players. Bad for the player. Okay, so so madness cards are always bad for the players. Never good for players. Well, there is an option in the game to play uh, a fifth player as a GM. So if you're the GM player, then it's good. <laughs> oh, it's good. Okay, all right, fantastic. <laughs> yeah, and that was one of the really neat things about as Rachel brought up that the game can be played solo. So if you just want to play by yourself, you can play all four characters, just draw the location cards randomly, and just play through the adventure. And so you can play by yourself. Or you can play it as a fully cooperative game where you play with three or four people and you all just play randomly against the boss. Uh, the, the, sorry, play against the location deck. Or what I've actually found to be one of the best ways to play it is you have one person play as the GM and they basically hold all of those location cards. And so they choose what monster or what place scenario you go into. 
Um, ah. And so you can sort of tell a story with it because each one of these locations has a little bit of flavor text about like when you're going into the derelict house, there's an unnatural storm that forces you into this old abandoned house that's got loose and missing floorboards. And so if you're playing with a GM, they can sort of like set the stage for why you are going here. And then the next monster you might go. And now you left that house and went down to the abandoned village and you came across this monster here. And so you can actually get a pretty decent story built out of these different cards that are sort of little set pieces for your RPG adventure. So it makes it much more RPG like. Now, I, you've said this, and I read this, and you can play this solo. You can yes. grab this deck and, and uh, have a role playing game for yourself. The deck is basically the DM. Yes. Yep. And uh, I mean, it, it's, it sounds phenomenal. How has that play tested? Uh, we've played test really nice. We've had um, a couple of videos that we've put out there with play testing. Um, just a week and a half ago, we were at uh, Atlanta, at Georgia, at a small convention, Southern Fried Gaming, um, and we had a video came up that we did there. And the group of people were playing phenomenally well. They were laughing, high fiving, freaking out about the card draws as they were seeing what bad stuff was happening. Um, it got pretty tense there. It was a really great. Uh, well, and something that we should mention, too, is when you're playing solo, for example, you can't cheat. I think that's sometimes a lot of times a solo game doesn't work if you can, you know, make it to your advantage. But with the monster cards, they have on there what player it attacks. Um, and so when you pull that location or that monster, it's going to attack one of your characters. Um, and then mm -hmm. you need to resolve that. Uh, kind of thing. So the deck in itself plays itself as the solo player. You can't say, "Oh, well, I'm not going to have it attack him because he only has one hit point." Um, so uh, again, if you if the monsters TPK your party you, as a solo player, you lose, <laughs> <laughs> and you can make that as challenging as you want it to be by adding the the madness into the deck. Okay. All right. So you know, I was looking as I was looking through this, and I was watching some of the videos that you guys have up. Uh, you know, I, I, you were going over how these things work, and it was really interesting. Uh, you know, and I would suggest anyone, you know, watching this uh, when you go to the Kickstarter page because you're going to go do that because uh, we know you will. Uh, <laughs> and, and at some point, we'll we're going to display the Kickstarter page on the video too. Yeah, we will. Um, but but go through. Uh, I think it's neat how the hero cards are set up. So they got they've got stats on them, and and how, to, how explain the hero card to me. Okay, so the hero cards have. Uh, four basic stats attributes, um, and at the moment we had for printability, we had to just get something out there because we were needing to uh, hit up a, con a couple of conventions. So we we're revising these, making them a little clearer just for what they're worth. But you got four attributes: you got your strength, your dexterity, your intelligence, and your wisdom. So those are the mm -hmm. four down the line. Uh, plus, right. in the corner you have the hit point values. So that's the green one. So 10, 15, 20 hit points. And at the bottom of it we've got the armor proficiencies and their starting equipment. And so each character will have their own set of starting equipment that they have, whether it's a potion or uh, a sword, shield, armor, etc. cetera. Um, and then you've got their armor proficiencies, what they're allowed to wear. So some of the characters might have armor proficiency for medium and heavy armor, but they don't start with medium or heavy armor. But if you find it along the way, well, then you can use it. Ah. So that's pretty much all that's okay. on the cards, uh, in addition to special abilities. So... Uh, each character has a couple different special abilities that they can do. Um, and that helps uh, make creating your party important. So you've got a variety of different special abilities. Uh, for example, we have the heal ability. That means players can, uh, at the end of their uh, combat or at the end of the scenario card, make a heal check to gain, uh, give hit points back to a player. Uh, you've got disable device, which on some of these location cards say, hey, if you have disable device, you can take a free treasure card. Or... Uh, if you have disabled device, you don't set off the trap, so you don't get hurt. So having somebody with a disabled device is kind of a good one to have in a party. Right. Um, you've got uh, Spellcraft, which allows you to use the spell scrolls, which lets you do magic damage. So uh, along with each one of these skills has almost always, uh, almost all of them have special ability things. Uh, for example, in this uh, abandoned laboratory one, one of the skills you have is the stealth skill. If you have stealth, it means that you automatically succeed at the uh, check trying to move through the lab without knocking over chemicals and blowing people up. So cool. having stealth is really useful there. And so yeah, trying to mix and match the party to have a nice, diverse, broad party. So you've got your frontline tank people, you've got your in the back Heidi people with bows and arrows, and you got some, a magic user, maybe someone with a disabled device. 
a nice blended party is usually the uh, best way to go. But you don't have to. Oh, okay. So I have a question for you. It's, so, so you're playing four characters, uh, and there's how many characters are there total? Uh, eight total. Okay, so eight, eight total. total. So you have to pick four of the eight. Um, and if you have a party, and as long as one person in that party has that ability, then then it gets used for that room. Uh, yes. So if okay. for disabled device, if you got one person with disabled device, you don't need to stack up that multiple times. Um, how the end of room actions go. Each person is treated individually for one action. And so let's say you've got the heal skill. The paladin with the heal skill for his end action uses heal to heal somebody. And then the alchemist in the party uses his alchemy ability to make a potion. And then you might have uh, a ranger that has no alchemy or healing. So he's going to make one of those checks at the bottom to try to do something on the card. Okay. So each player character gets one action at the end of the uh, location. Uh, okay. Okay. All right. I'll Okay, so uh, two things of housekeeping and questions. Uh, first, Rachel, if you could screen share again the, the cards you were showing. Pete, can you put her yep. back up? There's someone Got requesting it. they would like to yep. see the cards. Uh, okay. And as you're doing that, uh, the other question that came in the chat room is that there you go. Are, are there cards that do not fit uh, some of the situations? And if so, are they discardable? How do you resolve that? Or, as I'm assuming, everything is going to fit. Yeah, yeah, most things fit just fine. Um, occasionally, you have uh, treasure cards that you draw randomly, and it is possible to find a treasure card that just didn't happen to be usable for a, the party you've got, um, at which point it's sort of a dead drop. Um, with future expansions of the game, assuming we get back to future expansions of the game, uh, I've got ways to allow you to do some trading and upgrading stuff, but in the current version... Um, if it's not a usable treasure, well, then you just don't have a, you got a dead treasure, but most treasures are usable. Um, especially if you create a party that's balanced and covers all of the different avenues of gameplay, um, then pretty much every treasure can be usable. Um, I, but I do think that if you don't take a balanced party, cause you can choose what characters to play. So if you take two characters that have heal and two characters that have, you know, maybe, um, you know, or just like ranger and thief, then you may not have an alchemy ability to create a potion in your party. So mm. you know, there are disadvantages and advantages to obviously balancing your party. Well, that's yep. going to be with any party. So yeah, yeah, exactly. that's true. Yep. And I've, I've tried to do my best to make it so, not every has a there's probably one or two party combinations of the eight that I would say is probably not the way you should make a party, but I would say easily 90% of the different playable combinations are a valid, really good party build. And I wouldn't say there's any one party build that is the best build, so to speak. Um, right. it sort of depends on what the locations are. So right. that's one of the fun things if you were trying to uh, play as an aggressive GM trying to beat up the party, so you play with here's your friends playing the characters and then you're the GM, you specifically go, okay, what's a weakness in their party? Oh, they didn't have a character with a disabled device. Well, let's pull out the locations that say, oh, look, if you don't have disabled device, you take damage. Or let's say, oh, they don't have anybody with spellcraft. Well, let's choose a location card that says, gives them bonus stuff if they have spellcraft. Oh, nobody has spellcraft? Well, I guess you guys just miss out on all this awesome loot because you built a party that didn't have spellcraft. So, you can design parties that work, and if you're playing a G as the GM role and you're really wanting to stick it to the players, you can try to find the cards that are going to be most hindrance to the party if you're playing a mean GM. Or you could be a nice GM and find the cards that are just tailor-made to their party and just give them an easy go. Kind yeah. of to the players. More fates, more fates. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. Jimmy had also mentioned um, future expansions of the game. So this game obviously is based on our gothic line so the locations and the monsters are taken from our gothic campaign compendium but in future editions we were hoping to use things like our pirate line our forest kingdom line um even maybe some of the alien line that we have coming out in in order to create more locations more monsters so that you can continue you know adventuring through different expansion decks yeah, I, I wanted to say that because I, I think that this would, would really translate well for something like a cyberpunk type of uh, genre. Or space. Uh, for, or... For the... Yeah, space, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah as the expansions go, uh, assuming we can get to that point, which is I really hope to because... Ah, uh, we will. The, no, 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 we will. Don't worry yeah, about we that. We will. We, we got will you. Get to the expansions. So the, the way I've got it, rough design right now, basically you create your party, 
you adventure through just the base game as is, and then you take all of the loot that you've earned, and then you'll go into the um, lo the next set of location cards. So you'd have location deck one, and then you'd have location deck two, and you basically have the second episode, so to speak. And so we'll give everybody like level up tokens or something like that. And so players can get new skills and new attribute points that they can add to their party. So you play through the game once, then you play through it a second time with all of your leveled up characters in the second location deck and probably do a okay. third one after that. So you can do sort of a three part adventure series um, with the same party. And each time you complete one of the episodes where you go location, 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 boss monster, then you level your characters up go to the location deck two, play through that, beat the final boss, and then you can move to the third one um, would be my vision for how the expansions would go. But that will give you a lot of customization on your character. So you go, here's a really weird, wonky party build at level one, but because we can upgrade them, suddenly they upgrade to something amazingly crazy because they've got this ability over here or something as they pick up as they level up. Yeah, you gotta have, have a god a god mode deck to deal with those people. <laughs> yep, yep. A tomb of a tomb of horrors deck, right? <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> like, yes. I got you. Uh, uh, but no, that that's really cool. I, I like the fact that you can. I like the fact that you can DM this or game master this, and you can you can, you know you can stack things the way you want to. So I'm assuming. Uh, so treasures the, the when you get a treasure, it's a random pull of the deck, right? Or if you had a GM, yes. they could pull whatever mm -hmm. card that they saw as most fitting. Like if you were in that alchemy uh, room, they might go, well, you know, I'm going to give it, let me, hold on, let me find a, a potion. There you go. You got a potion because that's what would really be in this room, not a, you know, a flaming sword or mm -hmm. something. Right. <laughs> oh, and that's definitely doable. You could definitely have a GM assigning the treasure cards as a, right. as they deem appropriate. Yeah. Yeah. It, you know, I noticed that you're, you've got two different sized cards. You've got tarot cards and you've got poker sized cards. Um, mm. and, and I have a question that, uh, like, cause I've worked in production quite a bit, uh, and I'm, um, I'm currently doing my research for something I'm working on. Uh, did you do the two different sizes because of affordability? Was that, was that part of it? Cause I know tarot cards are, I mean, I think they're like one and a half times as expensive as poker cards to print. Yeah. There's, um, a bit of a price there. Honestly, most of it was from the playability of it. So having the okay. big poker cards, uh, uh, sorry, having the big tarot cards for all the information on the piece of art assets because we've got gorgeous art. We don't want to diminish that. And so right. all these locations and player characters, we wanted to have nice big frontal piece art assets. Uh, right. But you still had to have all the information on the card. So we needed a bigger card for those. In the playing of it, things like the fate cards, which are just, it says fate yeah. one. You don't really yeah. need a tarot card that says one on it. Right, um, right. So, uh, and it takes less, up a lot of the table space. <laughs> and it takes up a lot yeah. of the table space that way. So right. the, the two size card is mostly to show off the gorgeous art and mm -hmm. then to not eat up your entire table with small cards that are less important. Things like potions and fate cards, which you really don't need a big tarot card for a small art asset like that. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and that makes sense because you don't know what size table you're going to get. This seems like a really good game. So like if I'm hanging out at Gary Con, right, and I'm in the bar and a bunch of us decide, hey, let's play a game real quick. You know, we got like, let, let's, you know, drink some beers. We got an hour. Let's let's knock out one of these games. You know, my table is only going to be so big. If I've got, you know, four or five people playing, it's going to be very difficult to, you know, our cards are going to be tripping over each other. So that 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 makes sense. Mm -hmm. Right. And that, I mean, that's kind of the idea of get, having the card game too. We obviously want to bring in people to our industry that maybe um, aren't your typical gamers, right? Someone who maybe who's never played an RPG game before, but is curious what it's about. This is a, a very easy gateway into the RPG world because if they like it or they're using a GM and they want to further their storyline, they can easily pick up the Gothic book and then add in all kinds of awesomeness to their storyline. Um, for people who want to play solo, that's obviously a big push. Um, at one point, we had talked about doing expansion, and we hope that that comes to fruition in the future of expanding this game out to seven players. So you could do, you know, larger groups uh, playing the game as well, and make it more like a party game. So, like you said, you're at Gary Con, you know, you want to play for like an hour or two. You don't want to spend a whole day on Saturdays playing eight hours of RPG. Then you can, you know, bust this out and go through one location deck, two location decks, however long that you feel you want to play for. But um, generally, the game can be played, what, what would you say, Jimmy, under an hour? Oh, um, definitely an hour. You're looking about half hour, 45 minutes usually. 
sort of depends on how the deck draws and how people, how well people, if it teach the game, it takes a little bit longer, but after you know the game, you can sit doing 20, 30 minutes if everybody knows what they're doing and just playing through. Right. And then adding the difficulty to replay. So you're getting different locations, different monsters, different boss monsters, and then adding difficulty. So it has a replayable factor to it as well. So we're hoping that it appeals to a larger genre of people than just your typical RPGer. Right. Now, does this, now, you say this ties in with the setting. Can, could you conceivably use it with the setting? Like, could you, is there, is there like full crossover? Not full crossover. No, <laughs> There's three different adventures in the Gothic Campaign Compendium, and there are at different levels. So the idea initially when we did Gothic, um, and, for, and for people who don't know what Legendary Games does or did, we got into the industry as offering plug-in adventures for Pathfinders uh, for their line, for Paizo's uh, adventure line. And so then some of our adventures kind of jump around because maybe there was some... Um, you know, a gap on the seventh level in order to get up to eighth level so they'll give you some extra adventures or extra storyline. And it's written by the people who wrote the adventure path, um, the original authors. And so that's how Legendary Games got started. Since then, we expanded into our own line. We've got the Legendary Planet adventure path. Uh, we now do 5e, Savage Worlds, and now we're breaking into card games. And so the Gothic book itself, though, has a lot of other goodies in there. It's got feats, it's got spells, it's got rules for running your own gothic campaign. Um, and so it's not, the gothic book itself isn't a straight, okay, I'm going to pick this up and run level 1 through 20. It's more of a filler in for if you were playing, I don't know, Carrying Crown or something like that. Okay. <laughs> And so then you could essentially use these cards as your base and play with the cards, but if you're have if you are if you are the GM and you're looking to add a storyline, you could pull situations out of the book, the RPG book, and use that um, to further your storyline, and then use the cards as your location study. Now, obviously, there's no map, there's no tactical combat on right. here, right. Um, and so those would be some things that you would uh, traditionally be missing by not playing uh, the the tabletop as we know it. Yeah, right. uh, okay. when I was designing this, I was really trying to get the spiritual feel of the game of from the Gothic book more so than the mechanical of it, um, because obviously it's big and complex when you're trying to make a Pathfinder game. Those aren't uh, a small little, here, I'll teach somebody that's 10 or 12 in like half an hour. Um, so right. things like the uh, character cards, for example, the uh, name and the art asset for these characters were came directly out of the pre-generated characters in the Gothic book. And I tried to thematically fit them as best as I could while still making a balanced game. So that was a difficulty I had was trying to go, okay, make sure that I had all of the Gothic game mechanics needed for this game, but still trying to keep the spiritual feel of what those characters were in the Gothic book, uh, along with all of these monsters were also, uh, many of them came out of that Gothic with all of the crazy art. And so that's where the name came from and that's where the art asset came from. The, the art is fantastic. And the tie-in on that, like the pre-generated characters, in the book, there's three pages of its backstory and then also how you can level up that character for its proficiencies. Um, so obviously if you want to, again, flesh out the card game and make it more of a storyline, you would want each of the characters to read their backstory of their character. Okay. Oh, very cool. Hey, I got uh, we, get, we got some people in the, in the in, you know watching in the chat room and making comments. Uh, Spence, good buddy of ours, and, and and she works with me on TSR. She's she's gonna be doing game school, so she's gonna be one of my game school experts. Backed it. All right. Uh, while hey. we were talking, <laughs> she said she said gateway drug. Uh, I mean game. <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> yeah. And that um, is the goal. And David David, our, one of our one of our good fans, he's like, hey, thinking the same thing. Uh, first game is free. <laughs> right. So yes. Funny. I mean, that's kind of idea. If you want to have your kids play, if you want to have your mother play, if you want to have your neighbor who's never heard of RPGs before get into the game, this is that setting so that you, it's totally the gateway game. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. I need to, you know, I need to back this so that I can, I can, I can bring my daughter into role playing. I, I have, uh, I have some stuff for, for young players too, but I think she would like this because it's, it's just a, you know, it's just a card game, right? Just yeah. so easy. Wait, to but do doesn't it. legendary games, don't you guys, uh, have, or where was that? There was yeah, a role playing, playing adventures. Yeah. yeah, they can play ground adventures. 
no, we do. Like, well, I've written for Playground Adventures, but we have our own Legendary Beginnings line, which is absolutely a kids oh, friendly okay. line. Oh, um, cool. And so we started off by um, Paris Crenshaw had worked with um, a scout leader to go through um, and create a scouting event for his daughters. So that's how our first game was written. And then we had kickstarted Legendary Beginnings, the uh, Trail of Apprentice book, which is a five uh, part adventure path. And then um, I wrote an adventure last summer. I debuted a jig Han called A Feast of Flavor. And um, that's not specifically for younger kids, although there are rules in there for adults and, and other um, age, you know, it's, it's all ages. But the idea was to bring in that younger audience because at the time when I wrote it, my children were six and I wanted them to be a little bit more um, engaged. And what I had learned from playing with them is that they wanted to have more uh, hands-on tactical stuff. And so in there, there's a matching game. There's a chase cards. There's um, uh, social combat cards. They're skipping rocks with goblins, and you have to use all of your different dice. Um, so the idea is to capture the attention of children uh, more on hands-on stuff than just the storyline. And then there's a cute over cutesy overtone of um, the fae and food, and so everything has food names, and it's very silly and, and light and whimsical in that front. And then we went on to do um, Crisis at the Station, which was uh, written, again, by a father, um, and his children are a little bit older, so 10 to 12 age. And so our Legendary Beginnings line is basically written for our children, and so they vary in different age groups, uh, and they all tie in together in the, uh, the, the Kingdom of Thrill is where it's setting. Okay, very cool. So right. let me let me ask you, um, Jimmy. So this is your this is your baby. You said uh, how did how did you go from you doing this to you and Legendary Games doing this? How did how did you all meet up and, and decide to do this thing together? So basically, the uh, order of how this all happened was I designed my uh, first game, Legends of Draxia, produced that in 2016, and then started running around to conventions, selling it and promoting it all the way I could. Uh, I believe it was. In the uh, November of 2016 at GameholeCon that we first met up with mm -hmm. Rachel and uh, she sat and talked with uh, Teresa who actually does the game layout for the uh, cards so she's the one that did all the Teresa Weibler did all the mm -hmm. layout for all these cards uh, which she did a phenomenal job with um, and basically uh, Rachel talked with her a whole bunch and then with me a little bit and we went our separate ways after good conversations. Then the following Gen Con, we ran into each other again and went, oh, hey, I, Rachel said, I, I like this game. I, I know this. Do you want to do work with us? And I said, yes. So about oh, a couple weeks later, um, I sat down with Rachel. She showed me a whole bunch of different um, things they had. We went back and forth. And I decided that their Gothic horror line looked like they had a whole bunch of really good art assets to work with. And so basically, Legendary went here, have access to all of this amazing art. Then I did some game design to put it all together, took a lot of their um, existing content, try to create a world for it. Uh, and then, uh, like I said, Teresa Weibler sat down and did all the layout and put them all together to actually make it a game. Well, and we <laughs> first the played said, oh, okay. the Gothic game in its first iteration at, it was at a convention too. I want to say it was Gary Con. Was okay, that correct? Uh, uh, actually, Gamehole Con again. I think you. I think you played it at Gamehole Con again, the following. So from one year to the next year, we went from you saw me at Gamehole Con, and then following Gamehole Con in Madison, Wisconsin, uh, we sat down and actually played it there. So. so then we did some changes then, um, and then over the winter months, we also did some playtesting. Jimmy did playtesting on his end. I had a bunch of gamers um, come and playtest the game here, and then we made another iteration, and that's when we actually moved to the tarot cards and the, the poker sites, uh, the two different size cards. And then we got the final version that we have now. Um, but that being said, Jimmy's been continuing playtesting that, and we've made a few tweaks. So, Jimmy, do you want to talk about some of the tweaks that you've made? Oh yeah, so what I'm currently doing right now, um, it's getting really dialed in right now, um, but my goal is always to give the best possible play experience. And so right now, all of the locations are pretty well set, all the characters are set, all the monsters are set, the game is done. And what I'm doing is the micro tweaking of the game. So I'm going, okay, I wanna make sure that you can play it on easy mode, it plays easy. When you play it on hard mode, it plays hard. And so that's when I go through and I do the playtesting and go, okay, this monster, it needs one more armor. 
This <laughs> character here, it needs one more agility. This weapon over here, it needs one less attack. Just tiny little tweaks like that. And so um, I've just finished the most recent iteration of that. We'll be printing another prototype shortly. Um, and at this point, it's really dialing in very nicely. So I'm expecting after this one, maybe one more round of minor little tweaks of, okay, nope, that monster, he needs one more attack still. This location, the DC... No, 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 no. Less, one less, one less attack. <laughs> no, no, monsters no, need more. less attacks, one always. <laughs> All right, no, cool. So yeah, we're getting pretty solid right now, just tiny little tweaks, which will be done very shortly on my end. And as you can see, the layout's nice. We got a little bit of uh, polish to do on like making the icons a little bit more clear, so we'll get some clarity up there, but that's very minor on that. So yeah. when we go to printing, it'll be a really high-end product. Cool, cool. So Laura, or, I'm sorry, I keep doing this. Spence, Spence wants to know, what are your favorite character? What is your favorite character? If you had to pick one, uh, I'm a, Jimmy, it's your game. I'm gonna start with you. Okay, okay favorite character. Uh, you know what? I'm always been partial to wizard type characters. The uh, wizard character in this, uh, she's got the tried and true magic missile spell. So just a small little plink away. Um, but she does pretty get pretty heavy hitter as a character. Um, and what's really fun about her, I've given her a thing that you don't usually see on wizards quite as much. She has the stealth skill, which oh. you don't usually see, but it fit with the, how I was playing through it. And so she can, if somebody, if a monster is attacking her, she can go, nope, I'm stealthing. I'm hiding. Attack the next person instead. That's so a good skill for a wizard there. to have. Yep. It is. It's a little bit different <laughs> for a wizard, but makes it really fun when you go, nope, I'm a squishy little wizard, but I'm hiding behind that guy over there. And right. Push, push the damage to the next player. Attack the big guy. So, Rachel, what's yeah, your attack favorite? Attack the big guy, not me. Yeah. Well, I'm going to give a little sneak peek. One of our um, expansion goals was to create an exclusive card, which would have been the rogue. Um, so if there's ever a rogue, I usually play it. So that would be my character. Um, so we're hoping to get those uh, bonus goals or stretch goals unlocked so we can get those exclusive cards out. Um, but if... If we don't get that far, then I would probably play the witch, which has an alchemy ability to create potions, um, and there's nothing like a good acid flask to the face. Yep, mm. yeah, that that'll yeah. do it. Yeah. So, uh, and and Laura has one more, or Laura, goddamn, I'm sorry, Laura. Spence has one more. Uh, <laughs> she says, uh, it's, uh, I'm not even gonna go to what. What is the monster you don't want to you don't want to run into when you're playing? What's what what creature do you? Oh, that's like, easy. Who totally is the beholder of the into. game? Yeah, yeah. Who's the beholder of the game? That, that's this guy. The oh, Black okay. That, that, that's the, the guy on the front of the box, I believe. Oh, the one yeah, that gets yeah. the box. Okay, yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. 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 That's the guy you don't want to see. So what's really nasty about him, so normally when your monsters are doing damage, they've got a priority number. And so mm -hmm. your players are assigned numbers one through four, and whatever number comes up is the number that of the player that gets attacked. On that guy... His is every player. He attacks <laughs> all four people simultaneously. Nice. So he just smashes against everybody and just tears you apart. Um, as I've statistically designed the game, if you were to just randomly draw your location cards as a boss, he's only going to be drawn about yeah, 5 to 7% of the time out of the five different bosses. So it's a very low probability of drawing him without a GM intentionally uh, giving it to you. But it's designed to be the uh, the Cthulhu issue of, oh, look, Cthulhu came out. We all died. Right. It just happens. So uh, I wanted to have one boss in there that was nearly impossible to kill just because it was going to be that hard. It's not impossible to kill him, but it's definitely not the one you want to see. And who did the artwork for these? We have a whole stable of artists, so I don't have the specific names on each of these, but we're, that will all be on the credits in very, the, the box itself. But it's good. all from Legendary Games, Gothic Com Campaign Compendium book. Um, and the Behemoth has a 40 hit points as well. So if you're looking for something a little easier to beat, I would suggest the She-Devil. <laughs> the She-Devil, all, right, all right. My ex-wife. Right. So uh, oh. no, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. She's a lovely person. I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> all right, great. Um, all right, so so uh, I, what? Do you, what what's up? I wasn't able to share the screen yet, but at some point, if you would just wanted to go over and um, for anyone who was listening and um, wanted to see some of the um, the 
what do you call them? The, reward the boss levels? monsters. They're the, up on my uh, screen right reward now. Goals. Well, no, no, the reward goals. Or oh, the, right. Uh, if we wanted to cover that, but Pete, uh, we, we can do that at some point. I just didn't, I wanted to leave time and we're coming up okay. on time. So right, we're coming up on time. All right. So, so let me do this. Um, we'll, we'll go, let's do that. You know, Mike, let's do that now. Go ahead and share that. Cause this next question I have should be, we'll wrap up the show with the next one. Yeah. I'm having technical difficulties. So if, uh, I don't know if Rachel, if you could share your screen and you could just even kind of just talk a little bit about the, uh, the businessy parts and what people like go get. Go to the Kickstarter page. Pledges. Yeah, yeah. Give me just a sure. second. Figure okay, out how no to problem. screen share and do. Uh, <laughs> okay, can oh, you see the Kickstarter? Yep. Yep. Yes, perfect. Okay, perfect. So the first pledge is we wanted to cut right to it, uh, and you get the game. So for uh, thirty dollars, that's going to include your shipping to anywhere in the U.S., and then there's an additional shipping for outside. Um, and we are able to get this without the customs additional. Um, mm -hmm. fee on there uh, because we'll be kind of drop shipping to most countries and there there's some information at the bottom of the page on which countries that is so then moving to the next one we've got um, the gothic campaign compendium which is the PDF version and then the card game itself and then the next one at $60 you can get the card game the uh, PDF version and the hardback book of the gothic campaign compendium then at 65, you will get the card game, the hardback, the PDF, and then there's some exclusive cards that Jimmy will sign. So these are the ones that we're hoping to unlock. So right now they're not unlocked. So, um, you know, if, if towards the end we don't get to that, you'd want to jump back to the 60. But the idea is that we get these, Jimmy will sign the cards until you have an exclusive deal that will not be available post Kickstarter. Um, then for the Gothic Devourer at $100, it's uh, the card game, the hardback book, the PDF, and then we have someone who does custom wood boxes, and he engraves these with our images. So wow. on our, we haven't gotten the mock-up of it yet, um, but on our, some of our past Kickstarters, like our Pirate Line, you can see some of the wood engravings, and I think we posted some images here. Um, and his name's Matt, and he does those for us. So it's a limited edition for those, and then as well as you'll get the exclusive cards assigned by Jimmy. At 115, this is our horror showcase. So you're gonna get the card game, you're gonna get the hardback book, the PDF, the exclusive cards. Then you're also going to get uh, Legends of Draxia's base game, so with a game board in there, um, and their expansion pack. So the Legends of Draxia game is the first game that I had played with Jimmy um, that they have designed. And like he said, we played at Game Hokan in 2016. And it's a very intriguing game. It's got a little bit of Dominion feel to it because you're building your deck as you are um, gathering resources in order to build buildings or destroy monsters and then get spells to destroy more monsters. And in that particular game, you're trying to get uh, the most monster or most victory points, basically. Um, and so it play, it's a pretty fast game and it felt very RPG like so that's why um, in Gen Con the following year we um, Legendary Games had actually met with a couple of our distributors about how to push more of our books and they said they wanted some um, versatility in their in their uh, partnerships and they wanted us to carry card games so it just happened that I was coming from a meeting with our distributors and this is at 2 a.m. at Gen Con to mm. an after party. And I'd sat down with Greg Vaughn, who's one of the writers on the Gothic Campaign Compendium. And he, you know, I was telling him, you know, we need to get into card games. I don't know a card game designer. You know, where am I going to start? And Greg said, well, you should go try, try out Jimmy's game over there. And so I walk over there and I was like, oh, wait, I've played this game and I like this game. And it's very RPG like. So it just happened that it was fate that um, at that exact moment, Jimmy happened to be where he needed to be for us to make this deal. So, um, you know, I think Legend of Drexia is a fantastic game. Uh, it's very different from this game, but it pairs well in that idea that you can sit down and play, you know, 30, 40 minutes with a card, card game that's very adventuring-like. So for 115, you basically get their game, their expansion, the new card game, Fates of Madness, the Gothic campaign hardback and PDF, and our exclusive cards if we unlock those. Fantastic. You know, I gotta I tell you whoa, I, go. I I tell you, everybody I talk to who's who who wants to get into game design, doesn't need game design, uh, I tell them you you need to budget going to conventions. Okay? That's if if you're wanting to get into doing game design either as, you know, working on other people's projects or, or running your own, 
you must go and mingle. You have to, uh, or you'll never make it. You know, if you're sitting there on an island all by yourself in your room, hoping you know that your <laughs> your product will get out to someone somewhere, because uh, all the best stuff happens at conventions for this kind of stuff. So that that's really cool. That's really really cool. All right. So speaking of games and and cons and game cons, <laughs> um, where where are you going next? Where are you going to be demoing this next? Uh, so I will be heading out to Convergence in Minneapolis shortly uh, in uh, July 9th, I think it is, or something, uh, second, second week of July, I think. What about uh, Conjunction, I, in conjunction? And yeah. in conjunction is in Indianapolis, and one of our other Mythica gaming members will be uh, doing demos okay. of the game over at In Conjunction. So I personally will be in Convergence because they're overlapping conventions. Um, other than those two, I will be at Gen Con coming up, uh, so it'll be after the Kickstarter, but if you want to see me and play the game, uh, I'll be at Gen Con running games, uh, primarily uh, Legends of Draxia, because when you had to submit games, um, I didn't have Fates of Madness yet. When we we will have Fates of Madness and... at our booth, and we are yeah, housed we under be. our distributor, which is Studio 2 Publishing, and they have a whole alleyway of RPG games and game designers. So at Gen Con, I don't have the booth number right now, um, but if you find Studio 2 Publishing, you'll find Legendary Games as well as a whole host of other RPG companies in there. Um, we will have... Legends of Drexia there. We will have all of our hardback books that Legendary Games carries, as well as doing demos at our booth uh, for Fates of Madness. And then I personally will be at Gen Con and at Game Hole Con, and I will be running uh, Fates of Madness at, at Game Hole Con. I will also be running our uh, Legendary uh, Dungeon Delve, where you can see if you can survive, and that's played on Dwarven Forge. Uh, set up with minis from Reaper, um, so that's always fun for me to get to try and kill everybody <laughs> with nice. some of the pregens that Legendary Games offers. Um, and then my children will actually be at Game Hole Con too, and they'll be running events as well. Um, and we'll be running our Legendary Beginnings line for children there, since I head up the kids track at Game Hole Con as well. Cool. Well, yep. and, now, and I'll, I'll do Game Hole Con along with a whole bunch of other cons too. So I do about well, 15 a year. Pete and I are on the East Coast, and we want to know when we are going to be able to get to demo this. So, will you guys like never come to the East Coast? Is that is that? Well, like I said, I was in Atlanta, Georgia, just two weeks ago, yeah. doing demos. That's true. So yeah. Not too far. Well, uh, <laughs> um, we just got back from Origins. That's pretty East Coasty, right? Yep. Yeah. But, all right. So oh. I, I didn't say this part. Pete and I are very lazy. Yeah. We're Baltimore. <laughs> we, we don't need you just to go to the East Coast. We need you to come to the center, like yeah. D.C., Baltimore. We're, we're, Baltimore. And we're there. We're, we're, and we're there. <laughs> no, no, it, what, it, that's what, funny. What city are you guys in? We're in Baltimore. Baltimore. What kind of I need to go to? Uh, never mind. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> There's no Baltimore does not have a good gaming convention. It's a it's dead just, zone. Yeah, it's a dead zone. It's a dead zone. No, but we go to. to we do go up to Total Con. There you go. I was going to suggest Total Con. You maybe should get someone to run some games at Total Con. That'd be good. Okay, I will look into Total Con. Uh, we know people there. The <laughs> we know people. Uh, I'm probably going to go to Dragon Con next year. To run oh, there. oh, we love. We want to go to Dragon Con. No, well, in Momo, there's another one Momo Con, but we'll see. most I'm trying to find some big cons out in the coast. If you guys have suggestions of coast coastal cons, let me know because I'd rather go to one you recommend. Dragon Con, but. Yeah. Dragon Con is just more fun, though. It's I don't know how much you're going to be able to sell the game there, but there is a uh, role-playing track, but yeah. It's, 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 we could pair it with some cosplay and make it work. <laughs> yeah, all the cosplay is unbelievable. Well, if, you, if you Dragon paired Con. it with the cosplay, you would win. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm going to cosplay my car. They actually do really well at, uh, at, at uh, anime conventions. Actually, really well. There's uh, one called ASIN here in Chicago. Um, is huge, and I do really well there. Actually, all the all, all my games are light enough that you can teach into as introductory games. And so, ever uh, all these uh, anime people or cosplayers like go to conventions, they're looking for games. They just don't necessarily want a big, heavy game. And so, right. my game, games are enough that uh, do really well because there's, there's no competition for it. I'm like the guy there, and so anybody that has any interest in gaming, they just flood to me. So nice. I've actually done really well. At, yeah. Weird. That might... Conventions you wouldn't think I'd do well at. Huh. Hey, Mike, maybe maybe I should take that strategy for Balticon. You know, I'll just set up and, and the people just flock to whatever game I'm doing. <laughs> Give it a shot, man. You know, it, whatever, right? I, I'm your yes man. I'm your yes man. I think you should do it. 
You can, you can hux people. You can say, over here is a game over here. You yeah. want to play? You know, play hey, Mr. Hey, Mr. You want to play a game? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, Legendary Games is always looking for GMs, whether we attend a con personally or you attend a con and you want to run events for us, we are happy to send all kind of product your way. So if you guys ever want to run any of our card games or RPG games, just get in touch and we'd be happy to send some product out to you guys. All right, fantastic. You know what? And and we need to talk later about game school because we'll talk. Yes. Yes. Once so, this game goes public, this is game school. This well, is not only game. that, but other legendary stuff as well, you know? Oh, yeah. All right. So, all right. So let's give out links. All right, everybody. If you are watching this on, say, on uh, on, on our channel or, or somewhere other than the Kickstarter page, because if you're watching us on the Kickstarter page, you don't need to go to the Kickstarter page. But go to MakeYourGamesLegendary.com. And, uh, Mike, you made a bit.ly. What's the bit.ly for this Kickstarter? Bit.ly forward slash Fates of Madness, all lowercase. And take you right to the Kickstarter page, real easy. Uh, there's also if you if you're watching this video uh, on our page or on, on on YouTube, whatever. If you look right down the bottom in the notes, the the links in there as well. Yes. Um, and then also make sure, absolutely make sure to check out Mythic Mythica Gaming. It's M Y T H I C A G A M I N G dot com. That is for all of Jimmy's good stuff. Um, you know, and go go back this Kickstarter. This is really cool. I, I think mm -hmm. I'm I'm pretty positive I'm going to be doing that shortly after we get offline. Um, mm -hmm. I like it. My daughter will like it. It's something I can take to conventions and I can play. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I can just play anywhere. You know, sitting at the bar uh, when I'm tired yep. of playing my game. <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I've test run it so much. I, like they're like, "Hey, can mm -hmm. we try this out?" I'm like, "Yeah, you, sure, I have to, don't I?" Um, I love my game, but I'm tired of looking at yeah. it. We feel your pain. We know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, like... yeah my my uh, I've probably ran it about uh, 1,500, 2,000 plays. Right, it, right. To roll a con to go to, um, yeah, I, I I still enjoy it. Like I still play it and I still enjoy it. About the tenth game play of the of the convention weekend i start going i'm fine if i don't play it right right <laughs> right hey look the rules are really easy how about i give it to you and i'll just sit here and, and drink yeah. while you play how about that yeah, <laughs> right. Well, right. Actually, the best thing when i run these uh, all of my games i've played so with the fates of madness and a couple of the other ones i've gotten prototype and my draxio they are all simple enough after i've taught a group of people to play all the time the same group of people will still want to play or a couple people from that group will want to play and more people will come in and they will teach the rules to the people that come in. I don't say that. So okay. my games in general, Fates of Madness included, people, once they've played it once, they don't even reference rule books or anything. They'll just teach somebody else, sit down and teach them the game. Well, and that's just it. Once you know the icons on the cards, um, and you have, if, especially if you have a basic understanding of how RPGs work, um, you, I mean, with attack and stuff, with your armor class, uh, it's a very simple game to teach someone, and you don't really have to keep re referring to the rules because, I mean, the rule book like is just a small little booklet, a couple pages in there, mostly to identify what the icons are on the card are. Uh, what your attack is, what your you know armor class is, stuff like that. And um, but it plays very quickly, and it's very easy to teach other people. Fantastic! All right. Sounds like it has a good learning curve. Yeah. Yeah, a, a really short, shallow one. Yes. yes. All right. Yes. So, yeah. All right then. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you for coming on. Um, let's do. Let's let's close this puppy up. All right, everybody. You've just enjoyed the Kickwits. Uh, a division of the Mythwits, as it were. Make sure to catch our regular live show, The Mythwits, on Facebook, Mondays at 9 p.m. Eastern Time. You can ask us ask, ask us, or our guest questions or just banter with the other Mythfits. If you miss our live show, you can always catch the Encore episodes on Facebook or YouTube. Find us on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter as Mythwits. Check out Mythwits.com. If you don't have time for videos, make sure to subscribe to our podcast via your favorite podcast or do like, follow, subscribe thing wherever it's appropriate. And make sure to share your favorite episode on social media to help spread Mythwits love over the entire planet. Uh, Mythwits is part of TSR Podcast Network. Check out TSRPN.com for more cool shows. Mythwits is a Creative Commons product. Like and share it in all the places. Just don't edit it, don't sell it, and don't play a madness card on it, please. Make sure to check out Aetherforge.com for more cool stuff and joining our mailing list. Thanks, everybody, for checking this out. And if you're actually watching the credits right now, don't kid yourself. You want this game? Go back this puppy right, That's right. now. 
And that is Thank all. You. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs>